Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our epilepsy session of the Second Primary Care Congress. My name is Renim. I'm a medical advisor at GSK, and I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Hamza al -Siyub. Dr. Hamza is a consultant, child neurologist, and epileptologist, and he has also American Board of Neurology with special qualifications in child neurology. Dr. Hamza is the medical director at Kids Neuro Clinic and Rehab Center, and he is also part of professional organizations such as the American Academy of Neurology, the American Academy of Pediatric, and the Child Neurology Society. Dr. Hamza, thank you very much for joining us today, and I will hand it over to you for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Rania, for this nice uh, introduction. And uh, good morning, everybody. Even though I don't see nobody, I feel that I, as, I, as if I'm talking to myself, but at least uh, I feel that you are around. Uh, I'm really glad uh, to be here today, and uh, hopefully we will talk about um, epilepsy. We will uh, uh, talk about more of a general approach to epilepsy and how we can, you know, handle a case of epilepsy. Uh, we will not dig into the details, and I know this is a general uh, uh, conference, and it's not a child neurology conference. But I think we will be touching on a very important topics. As you see, it's called the uh, overview of pharmacological management of epilepsy in children. And uh, that's my name, Dr. Hamza al Siouf. Uh, and uh, currently, we are working at Kids in Euro Clinic and Rehab Center, Dubai Healthcare City. And we are getting into our sixth year of uh, operation. And so far, it has been a bumpless operation. Uh, now, I have no disclosure uh, other than uh, GSK helped me set up uh, the, the audio and I don't think this is something we need to worry about. And uh, so when we talk about epilepsy, uh, one of the m most important thing, we need to define what we are talking about. So, and we need to know as a general uh, uh, first liner, general pediatrician or a general doctor, uh, what is the difference between seizure and uh, epilepsy? So a seizure is classically defined as a transient abnormal hypersynchronous discharge of the neuron. This discharge might have clinical symptoms where we call it uh, electro uh, clinical seizure, what we see, and it might have no uh, uh, manifestation and we call it electrographic. Now, if I have two or more unprovoked seizure, then at that time, I can call it epilepsy. So if the patient has a first attack, don't call me epilepsy. If it's a provoked with febrile seizure, brain hemorrhage, brain injury, brain tumor, you don't call it uh, 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 epilepsy. So it has to be two or more unprovoked uh, seizure. Now, uh, when I see a case of seizure or I see uh, something that might look like a seizure, I would, uh, uh, it is really important to know how to handle this question. Uh, unfortunately, this is a video. The kid in the video, it's not working, would uh, do a sudden jerk of his head. Head will go down and then he continues doing everything. Uh, he uh, or she is absolutely normal developmentally and uh, uh, no change in Hamilton status. So if I describe this to you and excuse uh, me as I don't have the video working, what would you uh, 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 diagnose uh, this kid with? So the patient all of a sudden has a sudden jerk with head to drop, then goes back to what she does without any signs or uh, symptoms of alter mental status. Uh, she, is, uh, do, uh, she does it like maybe once, twice a, a day, and she has been doing it for a few weeks. What would you choose? Could it be an infantile colic? Is it a paroxysmal tonic gaze deviation of infancy? Is it Sandy Fire syndrome? Is it infantile spasm or benign myoclonus of infancy? Now, since I only can see Ranim, I will help her and answer the question, and I will tell her this is benign myoclonus of infancy. Good. Then, when I have an event, the first question I have to ask, is this event a seizure or not? Was the event a seizure or not? Because this is the most important point where I need to start. If it is not seizure, benign myoclonus of infancy, shudder attack, 
but axismal tonic upgaze deviation of infancy, then I can just let the patient go and tell him, you know what, uh, this is normal, it will go away. But if it's a seizure and it looks like a seizure, then I have to order the investigation that's needed. Now, the history, the most important, you would take, of course, the history. Uh, did you see the attack? What happened exactly? Uh, ask the mom, ask the parent. Most of the time they are panicking. They don't know what to do. And uh, they might not provide you with an accurate information. A lot of the time I tell them, do you have a video? Now, if you have a video, that would be a great help for you because, you know, uh, it will tell you, and uh, for a child neurologist who has who has at least seen too many cases like this, he can't tell if it's a seizure or not. Now, for you, the most important questions you have to ask. Remember, my first job and my duty to know if this is a, a seizure or not. If it's a seizure, then don't dig into the next step. But if it is, uh, if it is not, if it is not, it is not. If it's a seizure, I have to dig into the next step. If it is not a seizure. I will let it go. I don't have to order EEG, MRI, because once you go into the wrong direction, you know, as you keep going in, you will end up into far away uh, uh, area that is totally uh, uh, wrong. Loss of consciousness, sphincter control, tongue biting, was there is any change in the, you know, mental status, were the eyes open or closed? 95% of the kids or the adults who has seizure, while his eyes are uh, 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 closed, this is most likely not epileptic seizure. So if I ask a patient and tell him when he had the attack, were the eyes open or closed? If they tell me it is closed, then 95% of the time that's not a seizure. Very, very sensitive piece of information. Of course, you need to ask about, you know, did he have a history of spacing out, acting lost? any injury, infection, fever, family history, and uh, uh, any underlying diseases. That's always help you to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Now, when you do the physical exam, the most important thing, you first, you need to ask about the developmental status, and I would look also at the developmental status of the kid. Is there any new neurocutaneous finding? How is the head circumference? If you have a wood lamb exam, uh, you might want to look at Ashley's spot. Uh, look if there's any funny uh, or dysmorphic features. Uh, uh, I would usually look at the mom and the dad and look at the kid. And if he does not look like them, uh, but looks normal, that's okay. But if he does not look like them and look dysmorphic, low sit ears, uh, protruding uh, uh, mandel, uh, slanting eyes, and so ever, I would be a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, careful with such case. Now, of course, the family history is very important. If the dad has a seizure and it's a frontal lobe seizure, and if the grandfather have the same thing and the kid comes with the same complaint, most likely it is the same uh, problem. As you see, uh, coffee or late spot, uh, you see a neurofibroma, uh, you see if iris hematoma, these are all signs of uh, a neurocutaneous uh, finding. I think everybody is very familiar with them. And any uh, uh, doctor who has been to the medical school uh, most likely have seen uh, uh, some of the neurocutaneous findings. Uh, also, here you see ash leaf spot, you see uh, uh, adenoma sepatium, chagrin patches, you see them in tuber sclerosis. So look at the back, look at all uh, 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 the body of the, of the kid during the exam. Now, I took the history, I took the physical exam, and the event itself uh, looked like a seizure, right? Then uh, I will go and do the EEG. Please don't order EEG if you think this is not a seizure. Very common, very common question or request. You know, the family comes to me and tell me, Dr. Hamza, I have this, this uh, abnormal movement. Sleep may clone us, very common. The kids, is sleeping, eyes are closed, and he just jerk his shoulder, jerk his leg, and the one tell me, please, I want to do an EEG. I tell her, listen, ma'am, you don't need to do an EEG. And I don't do the EEG. Why? Because remember, if it is not broken, don't fix it. If it looks like it's not a seizure, and there's one to two percent of the people who has abnormal EEG, 
and I do the EEG and the EEG for God's sake it comes like it's abnormal with the, like let's say binaurolandic uh, 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 spikes how would you explain that to the family a lot of the time the family are very anxious they are very suspicious they they always confuse Google search with our medical degree all right and they will tell you oh yeah but the EEG is abnormal there is no way you can convince them that this is not related so if it is not broken don't fix it if i don't think this is a seizure i don't do it just to make sure or to reassure the mom and i'll tell you if i have time stories uh, uh, a miserable story i see all the time in my clinic now i think it's a seizure i did my history physical exam and then my next step we do the eeg what is the benefit of the eeg if the eeg is not available remember seizure is a clinical diagnosis so if it is normal it is uh, it still can be a seizure because as you will see up to 15% uh, of the population or the people who has epilepsy they will never show any interectal epileptic form discharges so it can help me diagnose the seizure yes I, uh, it looks like a seizure the eg uh, fits with uh, for example beranorandic seizure or infantile spasm or frontal lobe epilepsy it helped me classify the seizure it helped me in the prognosis. Yani, patient who has, uh, uh, let's say, 13 year old, she has uh, myoclonic jerk and she has an absence seizure. And you do the EEG and you will find out that she has uh, fast spike, but spike wave discharges, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. This means most likely she will stay on the medication for the rest of her life. I don't tell them that, but I tell them you're most likely going to stay for the, on the medication for a long time. So it does help you on prognosis and it also guide the treatment. What do I mean by guide the treatment? Very common, very common wrong practice. The patient gets the EEG done and then he will have uh, he will have uh, every three months a repeat EEG or sometime if the doctor is very generous, they do a monthly EEG. That's absolutely wrong, non-ethical. Uh, uh, and non-scientific practice. I do repeat the EEG in certain situation. If I have infantile spasm with hip arrhythmia, I repeat the EEG to make sure that the EEG is, uh, uh, is, is going to be normal. If I have a patient who has absence epilepsy, I do 24 hour EEG to make sure that all subclinical attacks are gone. If the patient is going to wean off the medication, Two years later, I repeat the EEG. Now, if the patient all of a sudden is well controlled and start to have a new seizure that's not related to the initial seizure, then I might consider repeating the EEG. To repeat the EEG every one month or two months or three months is absolutely not necessarily. And as I said, it's non-ethical, non-scientific practice. Now, EEG, there's two types. There is ectal when the patient, while the patient is seizing, this is, you know, you, uh, this is, we rarely capture this one. Every one year, we might ha have a patient who's doing EEG and gets a seizure during the EEG. And if you get this one, this is the gold standard, you might find out where is the seizure coming from. Interectal, which means be between attacks. So if I do first EEG in a patient who had uh, epilepsy, who has epilepsy or had epilepsy, then my chance to get abnormal EEG is 50%. If I repeat up to three EEG, my chance is 85%. But remember, EEG is a supportive diagnostic tool, but it does not help or does not tell me where to go. Assume you are practicing in Somalia, right? And they don't have an EEG machine. Would you and you see a kid? Would you uh, treat him if he is having seizure? Of course, because the epilepsy by the end of the day is a clinical diagnosis. Second, we did the EEG. Then I will do the MRI of the brain. The MRI of the brain helped me uh, to find out if there is any brain lesion, if there is any tumor, if there is injury, if there is stroke, gliosis, or any abnormality. And the epilepsy protocol means that the hippocampal area here, they do thin cut through the hippocampal area to look if there is uh, uh, hippocampal atrophy or hippocampal ab uh, abnormality. Now, sometimes I'm not sure if the patient 
or what the patient has is epilepsy or seizure attack or not. And this is, you know, uh, just like the kid we had last week. All of a sudden when she is running, she become blind and she cannot, you know, uh, uh, she cannot guide herself for uh, five to 10 seconds. Then at that time, what I tell them, okay, the EEG is normal. Then we will have to repeat or do 24 hour EEG to capture the event itself. And if we capture the event itself and the ambulatory EEG or video EEG is normal, then most likely this is not a seizure, okay? There's still a chance to be a seizure, but most likely that's not a seizure. So I don't do ambulatory EEG in every kid. It has to be indicated and the indication has to be dissected carefully. We don't practice medicine. You have to practice the art of medicine. Now, uh, question number two. I have seen the patient, the event is looked like a seizure. I did the EEG and I did the, 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 the MRI. Uh, then the question, I second the question, is the seizure provoked or not? There's a lot, you know, sorry for the slide because uh, uh, this unprovoked seizure should come after later. But, you know, you can find up into uh, 50 base of the time the seizure can provoked, which means injury, a tumor, hemorrhage, bleeding, fever, and there is a, 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 a mnemonic called vitamins that will tell you what are the, the, the underlying uh, a provoking factor for seizure. Now, when, now we need to stop here for this very important piece of information. A lot of the time, even my colleagues uh, who are trained in child neurology, they, if the patient has a seizure between one month, the classical presentation or the classical definition is five months to six years. Five months to five years, six months to six years. I call it one month to six, to six years. If you have a patient, who has a seizure within 24 hours of documented fever, which means I have a fever in the morning and I seize in the afternoon, and it is not provoked, and the patient does not have epilepsy, that's febrile seizure until proven otherwise. Rule of the thumb with the febrile seizure, what is the reason or what is the causative agent for the fever? You need to look and don't uh, miss uh, the, uh, the, 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 the fact that it might be meningitis. Clear, guys? So I don't have to have a fever at the time of having seizure. That is, that is inaccurate. Any fever with seizure within 24 hours in a patient who does not have, you know, a provoking factor like meningitis or who does not have, you know, uh, other uh, encephalitis, one month to six year after careful look uh, look for the fever uh, reason less than one year is called febrile seizure until proven otherwise. If you go home with this piece of information, then uh, you deserve to go to the whole uh, uh, conference CMB. Okay, so we uh, uh, took the history, we did the physical exam, we were we thought that much likely that the event is a seizure. Then we did the EEG. We did the MRI, we looked if there is any underlying cause. Then the third question for us that would come uh, uh, is what kind of seizure? So if you look at this kid, what kid would do, and again, I apologize, the video is not working. He would do this one, one, then two, then three, then four. So what do you call this kind of seizure? A repetitive flexion that usually happen when you wake up in the morning or every time you wake up from sleep in a kid who is around six months to uh, one year uh, associated with uh, uh, regression, the kid is not, no longer uh, communicating with the family, no longer is talking with the mom. And one case came to me, the mom told me, uh, you know, doctor, my daughter no longer answered her name. She was six months. Well, I told her I have never seen autism at six months. And while I was digging into the history, I told her, is she doing anything abnormal? She told me, yeah, she has a hiccup before she goes to sleep and she does that in a repetitive manner. Then that is most likely is infantile spasm. What is the drug of choice for such case? Sulfiam, Lemictal, Tubamax, high-dose Bredo, UKISS protocol, Kebra, 
all of the above. Mavi approached, throw everything on him, even the kitchen sink. You can, we need to stop this, you know, dangerous infantile spasm or observation. I will tell you, it is uh, what I use now after the ACTS became very, very expensive uh, and it became an orphan uh, uh, medication. Uh, I'm using UKI SS protocol, United Kingdom Infantile Spasm Protocol. And in my experience, it has been as effective as, you know, ACTH or a Vigabatrin. Now, sometime if it's not responding, I add later on Tubamax and they can push up the medication and they push start low, go slow until I reach sometime 26 milligram per kilogram per day. And uh, that is probably the highest dose I have ever uh, gone uh, uh, to. Okay. Now, what would the EEG looks in infantile spasm? It would look like this. Hibs arrhythmia. High amplitude, multifocal, uh, epileptic form discharges with disorganized background. Basically, if you read the EEG or the paper this way, or if you flip it over, it does not make a difference. Why? Because the brain is uh, storming with abnormal electrical discharges. That is a case you cannot afford to miss, which I mean, if we catch the patient early, we put them in a medication within the first three weeks and we hammer him down and we, we stop the seizure, most likely if there's no underlying genetic disorder or then the kid will, will, will grow to be normal. But if you leave the kid and observe, which sometimes, unfortunately, I have seen too many cases, uh, the, more, the more you wait, the more the chance will be uh, lower for you to uh, cure this condition. Here, money, time is not money. Time is brain. Time, time is cognition. So please, if you think even about, it, could it be infantile spasm? Call your child neurologist. One time I was in, a, in a, one of the courses in, in the, when I was in the, in the training and the, one of the uh, doctor told me, if I even think it might be infantile spasm, that is a, a spontaneous admission for 24 hour uh, video EEG because you cannot afford to miss this one. This is where we can make a big difference. Now, this is question number three. What type of seizure is very important? Now, classification, in general, it's a focal, which means it starts in uh, one part of the body. This can, I can decide this one on clinical presentation or through the EEG or through both of them, or generalized, which means the abnormal discharge on the brain starts everywhere. And I will show you this one. And then after that, you can divide them. Is it a complex partial seizure? A simple partial seizure? Is it focal motor? Is it sensory? Is it occipital? You know, by the end of the day, focal is focal. We know what's the medication. I'll tell you what's the medication we use for focal. And generalized is, is, uh, is a total uh, different uh, uh, treatment approach. Partial seizures can be simple, which means the consciousness is preserved. It can be complex which means consciousness is impaired. You don't have to lose your consciousness. It's impaired, which means I, I might not be acting normal, but I am still awake. So it's impaired plus minus automatism. And these both, they can go in secondary generalization. Consciousness impaired means you have bilateral cerebral involvement. Bilateral cerebral involvement you should lose your consciousness. Mean if the electricity is, or if the body, the patient is shaking in both sides, left hand, right hand, left leg, right leg, or a combination of that, and he is awake, that is 99% is not a real seizure. Most likely non-epileptic spill. Only one seizure can cause that, which we call a supplementary motor seizure. It's a super rare. I have been practicing since 2006. I have never seen it. So if the patient is talking to you while both sides are shaking, that's not a seizure until proven otherwise. Now, 2017 classification of seizure, 
uh, expanded uh, virgin. We have to come with the classification every now and then. I don't think it added in if anything. They just, you know, uh, changed the, 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 the naming and sugar coated. So focal onset with awareness symbol. Impaired awareness, complex partial. So I don't think this this classification ha has added anything to us. Focal is focal, generalized is generalized. Now that's why we talk about the focal. The patient came to us and he had generalized tonic clonic seizure. That looked like that's not the most common cause for generalized tonic clonic seizure is focal onset seizure. You do the EEG and you see you see sharp waves. This is what we call a focal onset seizure. So in this case, the EG could be very helpful for me. Generalized onset, it involves both hemisphere at the same time. And uh, most of the time, you know, the, um, the consciousness will be impaired. So if it's tonic, which means I'm stiff, clonic, I have repetitive abnormal movement. Combination tonic, clonic, atonic, you drop like, a bag, a cotton bag. You don't get the stiff and the drop down. You just lose the toe and then you hit the floor. A lot of the time, atonic, the patient get the stiff, which is tonic, then fall down. That's not atonic. Atonic, you lose your, the tone. Uh, myoclonic, sudden, fast, involuntary movement, just like the one we, we have sometime when we go to sleep. And absence, you just uh, stares off for a few seconds. And they talk to you, they shake you, they drag you, and you don't answer. This is most likely absence seizure. And if you do the EEG, you look here. Abnormal electrical discharge coming from everywhere. So that's what we call generalized epileptic form discharge. Uh, we will leave the question to the end, right? Right. Okay. Then let's take you know a, a little bit time. You know they used to call uh, the epilepsy uh, a falling uh, uh, sickness, and uh, this is if anybody you know realized this one, and probably the, my colleagues, the pediatrician in Dubai, uh, who have uh, listened to my previous talks, I always present this one to uh, tell you that uh, the, it has been a long time misery, uh, the epilepsy and the seizure for uh, for the human race. This is the Colosseum, and uh, this is where, you know, they, they, the, the people fight to death. And then after they fight, they start uh, the one who is uh, killed or being killed uh, or bleeding. They drag them through these doors and they used to collect their blood here. And this blood, they used to use it as drug of choice for uh, epilepsy. See, so epilepsy has been described in the literature a long, long time uh, ago. So that is, you know, uh, tells you how much of a misery epileptic patient uh, has. Now, uh, now Salim which trial? Uh, in the Arnaceans uh, decade, the, the patient who had epilepsy, they, they, they were uh, accused of witchcrafting. So, so they take them down and then they, uh, they uh, ask them not to seize. Of course, they are not seizing because uh, uh, they are doing it voluntarily. And if they do, don't quit seizing, they can burn them to death or they can uh, behead them, cut their head. And sometimes they can stone them to death uh, because they, they said, oh, you man, you're not seizing because they don't know a seizure. They, this is the uh, witchcrafting. And uh, that is, was very interesting, actually, you know, uh, finding in the history. Now, uh, let's continue our uh, talk. A treatment principle. Here, I want you to pay attention to me, please. If you are awake, stay awake. If you are asleep, wake up. If you are drowsy, make sure you, you, you give me your attention for uh, three or more minutes. Treatment. First, if there's underlying thing, treat it. Tumor, I'll treat it. Hemorrhage, I'll treat it. Infection, I'll treat it. Second, I will establish the correct seizure type. That's very important. Then I will treat based on seizure type. And the treatment principle, we choose the best medication that fits this uh, seizure, and we start low and go slow. So start low, 
and go slow until you reach the maximum dose per kilo. The maximum dose written in the in the in the leaflet is not the one we use. We use a lot more than the maximum dose there, or until the patient can tolerate the medication, or until the patient stops seizing. Please don't use spices style. A little bit of Tumamax. I reach five per kilo. The recommended dose could be for 15 milligram per kilogram. Then I throw Kepra. The, mag the recommended dose 60 milligram per kilogram. I reach 15 milligram. Then I throw a little bit of Lamictal. That is a disastrous approach to treat epilepsy. And that is one of the most common reason I see in my clinic for refractory cases of seizure. Remember, partial onset seizure, we are talking about certain medication, Trileptal, Kebra, Vimbat, three first liner. Generalized onset seizure, Kebra, Tubamax, Lamictal, Zonogram, Dibakin, plus the new medication. So if the patient has generalized onset seizure, don't put him in Trileptal. I would go with Kebra. If it does not tolerate it, I would go with Tubamax. If the patient has a uh, 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 Partial onset seizure. Don't put him in clobazam because we have it in the in the in the hospital and the clobazam is really good. A lot of the time, the family comes to me and tell me, doctor, you know, I I hear like you know uh, uh, this medication really good. I told him, no, this is not the way it is. We match, and the best medication is the medication that works for you. Another rule of the thumb: if the patient is well controlled in a medication, even if this medication you think. It is not good. For example, I hardly ever use Dibakin, even though here everybody uses Dibakin. And the patient will control in it. Don't change the medication. If he is on eggy plant daily and he's well controlled, please keep feeding him eggy plant because you never know what's going to happen. And I'll tell you later on what might happen when you play with the medication. Okay? Make sure you explain to the patient medication side effect. And if they are driving 16, 17, make sure you tell them don't drive until you are controlled six months. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 pay attention. You don't do that uh, because this can kill you or call somebody else. Okay. Here what we are talking about. This is the, the, the very well-known uh, uh, graph on how to treat, uh, on treating a seizure. If you use the first drug and you match it to the correct type of seizure and you don't use the spices style, I start low and go slow until I reach the maximum dose or the patient can tolerate it or the seizure will control. Your chance of success is 50%. Then if I use alternative monotherapy, you will get another uh, 15 to 20% and with your third medication, you get 5%. So you have 75% of the people will be well controlled on medication and uh, uh, 25, you cannot control them with uh, medication. Okay. All right, sorry. Um, I think probably I did that. that. Now, Nice evidence-based recommendation for AED choice. Let me tell you, let's go back. Start low and go slow. Match the medication to the correct type of seizure. Partial onset, I would start with Traliptal, Kebra, Vimbat. Generalized onset, I would start with Kebra, Tubamax, Lamictal, Zonogram, Dibakin, then Clobazam or Rivotril, okay? Absence epilepsy, Zerontin, Dibakin, Lamictal. Don't put uh, to max for absence epilepsy. The, you have to know it this way because this will make your life very, very helpful. And this is the nice guidelines, but based on our experience, these are the best medication and based on the uh, evidence base, these are the best medication you can use in either type of seizure. And this is for epilepsy syndrome. Okay, uh, do we think we have time for that, Ranim, or we'll pass it? Yes, sure, doctor. Let's go ahead. Okay. Uh, let's take time out, and uh, we'll go now for, uh, uh, and, you know, uh, we'll talk about, you know, the politics among uh, physicians or the uh, feeling jealous of a pediatric neurologist. 
because uh, one of my friend one time he told me well you know i feel I, I feel you know listen i feel really bad for you man i told him why is that he told me because uh, you know your feed is very difficult i told him you know what muhammad definitely you don't know what you are missing so i wrote uh, uh, you know uh, a poem kalam masjur just to answer and counteract his uh, complaint. I don't know how many of you, you people uh, 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 can understand Arabic, but I will talk in Arabic. I will uh, explain it. Uh, if you don't understand Arabic, uh, you know, we really are not talking about you and we will have another, you know, English uh, uh, version. So I told him, Muhammad, al jawab ma satara wa tasma'a. Fa katabt al kalam al masjoo al hilu hadha. لا يرقى إلى مستوى الشعر ولكن هو كلام مسجوع مما يستأنس به فحكيت له أنا شرحت القصة ومعاناتي فأنا حكيت له قلت له أنا طبيب عصبية أنا إنسان أحب مريضي والأهل والعمل بالإتقان أنا طبيب على العصبية الهضم ما يهمني هذا مال مقدادي مقدادي هو الذي انتقدني ومال نسيان يهمني مريضي ومشيته والخطوة على الخطوة والدوزان هذا it's a, it's a head heel to a toe test فور اتاكسيا احب مريض يمشي سيده بثقه وخفه وقمه الاتزان انا اعشق العضله ولك والعصبون وردود الفعل المنعكسه تكون اثنان ديب تندر ريفلكس بلس 2 بلس واحد او اثنين زين ات كان بي 1 اور 2 اتس اوكي ثلاثه واربعه مشكله بالمركزي يا انسان سنتر نيرفس انجري كان جيف يو بلس 4 ريفلكسز رقم سبعه وشلل بال عوده ما يتحرك الوجه وتجمد الاجفان فيشيال بالسي آه، ثلاثه سته اربعه آه، معا العين كل حركاتها ميزان ذيس از يو نو وات موف ذا ايز ليفت اند رايت ار ذيس ذيس نيرفز الثالث يرفع الجفن مره ثيرد نيرف والضعف يسبب الذبلان توسز السادس رادار العين يحرك يمين وشمال من دون خذلان ذا سكس نيرف موف يور ايز ليفت اند رايت القلب تحت السيطرة دوم والحائر يخربط الدقة والخفقان which means vegan nerve injury or vegan nerve stimulation can drop your heart rate and you can put you down النفس داخل الصدر وجلان يختل وينشل بومضة من العصبان which means you can have a cardiac arrest you can stop breathing if you have a seizure right which is abnormal hypersynchronous discharge خلق الرحمن خلق, خلق الإنسان من العصبون للقلب الأصغر البيان Uh, I can hear you guys clapping, so thank you very much. We can, uh, we are done with our drama now. We'll go back to the business. Uh, a few pieces of information. Neonate, I can use phenobarbital, phenytoin, and kebra. Uh, I try to avoid kebra in psychiatric patients. Debakin, I try to avoid it at all expenses, all the times, as much as I can. But sometimes I have to use it. Why? I always tell the family, if you have 1990 Mercedes Benz and you have 2022 Mercedes Benz, which one you want to drive from Dubai to Abu Dhabi? Both can work. Both can take you to Abu Dhabi. But with 2020, you are a lot more assured and you will have a much smoother uh, 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 trip. Tubamax, good for overweight. Let me tell good in delayed the breast and bipolar patient, but don't forget the, the rash. Of course, 75% we can control them with medication, 25% no medication. Remember, three or more medication, most likely are refractory, but where the medication used in the right way. I always tell the patient or I always tell the doctor at the time when there is no rules, stick with the basic rule. One time I was called and uh, to a patient, the first, uh, and it was my first consultation uh, when I came to Dubai. A kid in uh, one of the hospital here, he has been seizing 30 times a day. Focal onset seizure, right-sided uh, right -sided stiffness, and with altered mental status, complex partial seizure. He was on five medication, and they were uh, preparing him to be shipped to Canada for surgery. And they called me when I when I came, I told them, Mom, Mom, he's already on five medication. What can I do for him? But as I told you at the time when there is no rules, stick with the basic rules. So I took every medication and I based it on weight. So I still remember that. He was on Tubamax, two per kilo, Predo, Triliptal, Oxacarbazibine, 41 milligram per kilogram, 
and he was also on on uh, on uh, Lemectal, and the last one was I think uh, uh, Kebra. So five medications. None of these medication is even at the fifty percent of the recommended dose. So I told her, listen, partial onset. I'm going to take the oxacarbazepine because we still have way to go. I pushed it from 41 milligram to 62 milligram per kilogram. He dropped down to one seizure a day. Then I pushed it to 75 milligram per kilogram, zero seizure. You see how important to dose per weight and start low, go slow until you reach the maximum dose or seizure stop or patient can tolerate it. Please don't do spices style, like a bit of Lemectal, Tubamax, Kebra, because it does not work this way. Now, surgery, I'm not aware of any uh, good surgery center in the Middle East, so it might not be an option for us here in the Middle East. Second, a ketogenic diet, you know, it is, it is, we have only maybe one center in UAE that can do a, what looks like a ketogenic diet. Uh, it's success rate 35 to 40 percent. It's difficult. Uh, it's a, a nightmare. Vegan nerve stimulator. Also, it can help. Seven, seven percent might be cured. Fifty percent might get better. More than fifty percent. Now, uh, this patient, a uh, video is not working. Uh, he is hooked up for 24-hour video EEG because the doctor felt that the movement he is doing is is not right. He just Tilt his head and look to the right, then go back. Then do it again. It was very minor. And uh, with this uh, history, just look at me. If you can see me, he would do. Then go back. Sometimes do this one and go back. And uh, he is developmentally delayed. The EEG, regular EEG is normal. Are you concerned? Yes. No, I can't be. I might be. I need to ask a friend. Of course, uh, and uh, my apology, uh, because you guys cannot communicate with me directly, uh, this was a case of infantile spasm because the index of suspicion was high. The patient is delayed. It is a repetitive, stereotypical behavior. It was associated with altered mental status, and the patient was not communicating well. EEG is normal. We put them 24-hour EEG. We captured the event. It turned out to be an infantile spasm. Okay? Now, guys, uh, this is, uh, uh, we have said before, please, if your patient uh, is, is adult or a young adult, tell him not to, to, to drive. Why? Because you might have a seizure, especially the complex partial seizure. Look at this lady here, and look at this guy walking, and all of a sudden, the guy is flying, and the lady, uh, she as if she does not see anything okay and later on look at her staring they found out this is a case she has a complex partial epilepsy and she had uh, uh she she had a seizure while she was uh, driving and then if her neurologist did not document that he counseled her about driving then he will be in big trouble at least, even if, if it is with the legal or with the with the with the medical legal, at least you know uh, between himself, uh, why I have not told him not to drive. So please, if your patient is an adult, young adult, or is driving behind his parents, tell him not to drive. Wait six months. Otherwise, there will be another guy flying like this lady. Okay. Now. This is uh, this is for the people who uh, understand Arabic and who does not understand Arabic. This is another, you know, uh, uh, what we call kalam uh, masjur. It was also uh, uh, and uh, to explain how much I like neurology and how much I would uh, I would be a neurologist. And even if I can go back to the medical school, I would go into child neurology again. It's extremely exciting field, lovely field. If you look at it. And if you really uh, uh, enjoy the underlying pathology. So I wrote this one, I think, probably, Ranim, maybe six years ago. I really have to update it, okay? And uh, to express how much I like uh, neurology and also to touch a base on some of the signs you would see when you have a neurological injury. So I uh, told Muhammad, the same guy, every, everything should be blamed on Muhammad. 
Muhammad Maghdadi, he's the problem. Uh, so I told him, you know, listen, I really love neurology. I love it to death. Without neurons, uh, I would not have a breath. Without my neurons, I will be deaf. I'll be confused. I'll be stiff, spasticity. Without them, I will have a useless nose. I will not be able to smell even a rose, a nosemia. Without my neurons, my neurons, I can't be. I'll be blind. I will not see. Without neurons, will lose my mind. I will be rude, crazy, no longer kind. Psychosis, of course. Uh, my thalami are my Wi-Fi. Without thalami, no ideas fly. Sleep spindle develop there. Frontal lobes keep my hope. Without the lobes, I see a dark globe. Frontal lobe injury cause severe depression. Cerebral lie help my gait. Without the eye, I walk but never straight. Ataxia, my cords keep me adored. Without a cord, never on the road. You will get diplegia. Facial nerves help me blink. Without a blink, I can't even have a wink. Facial nerve injury builds palsy. Amygdala keep my fear. Without a fear, I love the Zaire. What we call a clover boosy syndrome. If you have injury in the amygdala bilaterally, you will go ahead and hug a lion. You will be going and kissing a, a, a snake because you no longer fear the, uh, the fear. Uh, please exercise, keep a healthy heart, feed my neurons, keep me smart. Uh, please. Do me a favor, leave me alone. Don't stress me. I need healthy neurons. Stress is the major imitator. Remember that. Please help me save my neurons. Please give me stat volume only alone. Stop the seizure as soon as you can. For neurology, take off the hat. Don't hesitate. Please take it off stat. In neurology, never what is this or that. God created the neurologist, the smarts. And more to come to counteract uh, Muhammad, uh, you know, claim. Questions for me, guys. And my apologies because I did not put this photo or picture to scare you up. But this is where I belong. I came from Jordan, and this is a classical look for a Jordanian soldier in Jordan. So I hope you have in, enjoyed the talk. And uh, uh, if you have, uh, before we go to the question, I just want to share with you guys this study and uh, that we published like four months ago. And we described uh, uh, how we uh, treated and cured uh, uh, 10 of out 18 patients of autism. It is published in uh, Neuropsychiatric Disease and Treatment. Now, this is a retrospective study for the sake of a prestige and for the sake of the uh, 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 impact factor for the journal. It would be rejected at the impact factor 6, but we were lucky to get it 2.5. But this is the first study that ever reported how autism was cured using scientific methodology and in detail description. And uh, I strongly encourage you guys to go and dig more. Soon, inshallah, we'll have another publication. And in the end of the, of the year, we might have a big, large retrospective series on using our protocol, medication protocol, on how to cure uh, autism. And it's all explained in this uh, 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 article, if anybody interested, please run him, let me know. I can share with them the, the, the PDF and it's open access free. And I really do thank you guys for uh, sparing the time on early morning Friday to come and listen to uh, my neurology talk. I hope it was not really uh, boring. And uh, remember, uh, uh, neurology is really very interesting and I really love it. But I might have to do early retirement because it can be overwhelming. Thank you. Thank Question. you very much, uh, Dr. Hamza, of course, for the fantastic presentation. It's always a pleasure hearing your talks. And uh, I myself am a very big fan of their uh, poems. <laughs> and, uh, you Thank know, you epilepsy know. is a very critical uh, disease. And we really thank you and appreciate that you're sharing from your clinical experience uh, with all of us. So actually, we have a lot of questions. I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that we have enough time to answer all of them. Definitely. Uh, yeah. So let me just uh, start with the first one. So uh, this one says, how can I differentiate between breath holding attacks and an attack of epilepsy? A breath holding attack, first the age, the kids are usually less than two years. They cry, 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 then they take a deep breath. <gasps> then they become blue and they go down uh, on the floor and they might get tonic, but it's a classical, the presentation is the most important thing. That is the cyanotic uh, breath holding spill, something called pallid syncope, where the kids, when he has a very uh, quick, painful injury, they, the heart rate drop and they get stiff. 
So I think that if you look at the, uh, if you have seen one or two breath holding spells, it will be easy to differentiate. Cry, 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 and then a big deep breath. <gasps> then they get stiff and they become very blue. That's a classical presentation. That's not the seizure and no need the EG to be done. All right, perfect. So uh, clinical presentation is very important. Uh, so for the second question, uh, if seizures are secondary to a primary neurodevelopmental disease, what would be your recommendations in this case? So I think this is a more of a general question. Uh, if a seizure is of what? I repeat the question, please, Rani. It is secondary to a neurodevelopmental disease. Right. Well, uh, we, uh, as I told you, the uh, neurodevelopmental disease, you are talking about the whole genetic field and the whole neurometabolic field. But to make it easy in you, if it's fit with any specific uh, 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 syndrome, like for example, Dravet syndrome, then I would use the medication for Dravet. If it does not fit with any specific condition, stick with the basic rule. Is it partial or generalized? Is it infantile spasm, absence, myoclonic? Then I will use the same medication I told you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, now for the third one, is there any correlation between seizures and mobile phones, especially with children uh, who are under the age of seven years? Next, uh, and and child with ADHD can uh, go with epilepsy at any age. So I, I think the question mainly is regarding the correlation between phones and uh, epilepsy and ADHD. Yeah, uh, 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 epilepsy and the ADHD, whenever you have any brain uh, uh, problem, you are prone to have more problem. So headache is more pro more uh, uh, more uh, evident or can happen more in patients with epilepsy. ADHD, I would say, uh, I did not necessarily see too many cases where they have epilepsy and ADHD. But remember, ADHD is a very common condition. So uh, 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 you might have a kid with epilepsy and ADHD, but it's not necessarily, it is, it is higher incident. It is the fact that kid with ADHD can have epilepsy. Now regarding the mobile phone, do me a favor. Uh, two things about the mobile phone. One, there is the beta, beta uh, rays that goes to the retina. Don't use it or use the iPad or iPhone before sleep because this will mess up the melatonin and you will not sleep. And the sleep is the most important factor on controlling the epilepsy. Uh, if you don't sleep, you are going to seize, no matter what. And second, uh, uh, studies uh, ha ha have shown kids or who have a, a cell phone next to them at the bed, they don't sleep well. They sleep as if they are on duty. So they don't go into deep deep uh, sleep. So if if um, anybody has a, a cell phone, make sure he hand it over before he goes to his bedroom. Okay, well noted. Uh, so we have another question regarding anti-epileptic drugs. So this one says, I know a lot of new anti-epileptic drugs are introduced, but still Depakine and Tegritol are approved ones to start with either general or focal but we see a lot of adverse events coming uh, with these medications. Uh, would you be able to share your recommendation for focal or general seizures? Right, as, a, as I said, remember the old medication, they are effective and they are as effective as the new medication. But remember, they are as if you are driving 1990 Mercedes versus driving 2020 Mercedes uh, with the new medication. So I hardly ever use Tigratol. I don't remember I have ever started any patient on Tegretol. Dibakin, I have hardly ever used it unless it is indicated for uh, absence epilepsy in the absence of uh, Xerontin. The, the partial onset seizure, Oxacarbazepine, Kepra, Vimbat. Generalized onset, Kepra, Lamictal, Tubamax, and then Xerontin, uh, uh, Clobazam, Rivotril. Then I will go down to Dibakin and Tegretol. Tegretol, if the, it's a generalized onset seizure, as per the EEG, don't use it. But remember, generalized tonic clonic seizure, it, could, it is most likely partial onset. So Tegretol will work. But Tegretol is contraindicated in generalized onset seizure as per EEG. All right, great. Thank you, doctor. Uh, so we have a question here. Uh, as a general pediatrician, we scan a lot of cases and some of them require uh, immediate intervention. So until we refer the patient to the pediatric neurologist, 
Uh, what type of primary intervention would you recommend if I'm not sure that it is epilepsy? Well, if the patient is, uh, the, the emergency in this case is the status epilepticus or the patient is actively seizing. Of course, at this case, you're going to have to go ahead and put him in the hospital and treat him as a status epilepticus. If the patient is not actively seizing, please do me a favor and do yourself a favor. Do the patient a favor. Call the nearest child neurologist near, uh, near to you, child neurologist. Most of our kids are being treated with adult neurologists. Here in Dubai, the majority of the kids are being treated in adult neurologists. Refer the patient to a child neurologist, preferably a fully trained child neurologist, not a neurologist with a special interest in, 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 in not a pediatrician with a special interest in neurology or adult neurologist. We share only neurology, neurologists with the adult. We are total different gamut than the adult neurologist. So if it's a status epilepticus, admit him. If he's not actively seizing, you must know somebody around you, just like what my colleagues does. They always call me or they send me WhatsApp, Hamza, what do we need to do? I told them, listen, I need to see this patient. Or no, I don't need to see this patient. This is so and so. Make a good relationship with your nearest child neurologist and uh, open a communication channel with him. If it is emergency, admit. If it is not emergency, give him a medication to stop the seizure if it's happening again, like rectal bedazepam or bacrimidazolam, and ship him to the near child neurologist. Okay, thank you very much, doctor. So uh, I'm just going to take one more question, uh, just to be conscious of the time. Uh, and I think this is a very important one. So which uh, medication would you think is the safest to use uh, while pregnancy? So I think, <laughs> I'm not sure if uh, this is a right. question for you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. That's, uh, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, remember, I'm a child neurologist. Yes, I have an adult neuro neurology training one year, but I have not been practicing adult neurology since 2009. So I would tell you, I'm not the best one to answer this question. But as far as I know, Kebra, Lemictal and maybe Tubamax are okay to use, but don't take my word for granted because I don't see pregnant uh, uh, ladies. All right, thank you so much, doctor. So uh, we have a lot of questions uh, and for the audience, I would make sure that we go back to you on, the, on your questions. Uh, doctor Hamza, thank you very much. Always a pleasure, always uh, lovely uh, attending your uh, talks and thank you very much for sharing your presentation and your experience today. For our yeah, thank audience, you for having me, Rameem. Thank, thank you, so you for having talk. me, Rameem. And if anybody has a question, just share with them my, my, uh, from my colleagues my email or my WhatsApp and we'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you very much and have a good day. Definitely will do. Thank you so much, doctor. And thank you everyone for tuning us in with us. And please enjoy the rest of the sessions. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.